Hi, I'm Jill Lamar, the director of the Discover Breakthrough Writers Program. We're here in New York today to celebrate the 2008 Discover Awards. And in just a couple of hours, we'll be giving away the awards to the best fiction and nonfiction writers published last year. Looks like we have a good crowd and it's going to be a lot of fun. I don't need to remind anyone here of the importance of literature, but it's helpful to recall why books are so important to us. Nonagenarian Diana Athill offered the following comment in her memoir, Stet. Books take us beyond the narrow limits of our own experience and enlarge our sense of the complexity of life, of its consuming darkness, and of the light which continues to struggle through. To get the awards presentation underway, I'd like to introduce jurist Kate Christensen to announce third place in fiction and present the $2,500 check. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet the writers that we've been reading. In his second novel, Sway, Zachary Lazar teleports himself by means of his imagination into the bodies and psyches of the madmen and superstars who ruled over the end of the 1960s. Sway is a cracking whip of a book, and I'm delighted to present this check to Zachary Lazar. I responded to this book the way I responded to, um, to Salinger when I first read him. So um, it's uh, a delight and an honor to, uh, to bestow this check to Benjamin Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for writing the book. It's a really lovely book. Thank you, Barnes and Noble. I want you to know, I'm not going to read the first page, but I'm going to tell you the first words that I read. After she threw the baby in, nobody believed me for the longest time, but I kept hearing that splash. All right. Jim Phillips fired the gun in the first sentence. Now, how do you get away with that? I don't know. Did she build up to it? No. No, didn't feel the need. The book that comes to mind when I think of The Well in the Mine is To Kill a Mockingbird. This is as good as To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm here to tell you that. Harper Lee comes to mind once again, and I believe that we have found her. And Jen, I love you for this book. climbed the stairs two at a time. Then she hefted the heavy cover off that well like a man would with no trouble. I couldn't see the baby at first because it was underneath her coat, but she took it out, a still little bean-shaped bundle wrapped up like it was January. I could have reached her in five or six steps if I'd moved. She held the bundle like a baby for a minute, tucked under her chin like she was patting it to sleep, whispering. The blanket fell back from its head and I saw a flash of skin. Then she tossed it in. Just like that. Not long after the splash, just a quiet small sound, she lifted the square cover again and fit it back into its cutout space, settling it in with little careful touches. Even with all that weight, the porch boards didn't creak when she left. I felt my teeth dig into my bottom lip, maybe drawing blood, but I was quiet as a mouse and stiller than one. Mice scatter like marbles. Let me read this, this brief passage from it. It's the strangest time, a birth, for life to start falling apart. Just like that, the very next moment. It's rare, but it can happen. And it happens to us. Uh, those are the words of an extraordinary writer, uh, Nia Wynn. Uh, please come up and accept your prize.
one of the best books that I've read over the past few months has been Eric Weiner's book, The Geography of Bliss. It's a book that is essentially an antidote to what's going on around us now. He travels, he journeys around the world, he gets high in Amsterdam, he gets drunk in Reykjavik, all in the search for bliss, what makes a country happy, um, which is a terrific read, particularly given all that's sort of happening around us. So I'd like to say, hey, Eric, so you want to come up and say, take a bow. There are almost not words to describe how much we all love David Sheff's book. And it's been a really long time since a book has made me cry. And this book made me cry on three different occasions. And um, very funnily, when I said this to my uh, co-judges, they all demanded to know exactly which instances it was that made me cry. And then when I saw um, David earlier this afternoon, I said, your book made me cry. And his immediate response was, where did it make you cry? Well, tell me more about you. Um, please come up, and uh, we loved your book. Beautiful boy. It's the morning of the third day since Nick disappeared. After French toast, Daisy and Jasper play in their room for a while, and then, though it's drizzling, run outside. By the time I corral them, we're running late. We'd better get them going or they'll be late for school. They race through the house collecting homework and cleats, stuffing them into their backpacks. Karen takes on Daisy's tangled braids and then heads out to drive them to school. When they're gone, I'm left to fall apart again. Where's Nick? I'll not accept the most likely answer, that he's relapsed. He's been doing so well. It's not perfect, but he has good friends and a good job. He's biking and riding. He attends AA meetings. Overall, he seems enthusiastic about his life. I know sometimes he's lonely, but who isn't? Sometimes he's down, but who isn't? Sometimes he feels overwhelmed, but who doesn't? I call the police and hospital emergency rooms asking if he's in jail or if there's been an accident. Each time I call, I brace myself for the unthinkable. I rehearse the conversation, the stolid, disembodied voice that tells me my son is dead. Indeed, one time I call the police and a dispatcher says, Mr. Chef, have you called the morgue? It was my next call. Guilt and self-blame and regret are typical responses of addicts' parents, but they're useless and incapacitating, yet I can't silence them. Where is Nick? I can't take this any longer. And yet every time I think I can't take any more, I do. Thank you.